Hi, thank you for joining us for Gardening for Pollinators. This presentation is hosted by Tarrant Regional Water District and the City of Arlington Public Libraries and the City of Arlington um, Water Utilities. And um, before I turn it over to our speaker to talk about Gardening for Pollinators, um, I'm going to give you a little message from the City of Arlington Water Utilities who's sponsoring this. And so um, you can go online if you're a City of Arlington resident and you have one of the remote re meters, you can go online and sign up to see all of your uses information online and you can set alerts for your um, high use. So if you're out of the house and for some reason a lot of water is being used or something, you'll get a, a notification and it'll let you know. Um, or if you want to set it at a certain amount and you want to make sure that your bill doesn't go over that amount, you can get a, a, a notification for that. Something new that they just added is hourly usage. So um, you can actually see the hourly usage and that's updated twice a day and that's something that's new. So once again, if you are an Arlington resident, make sure you go and sign up for this so you know how much water that you're using. Okay, and so once again, like I said, this is sponsored by Arlington and the Interior Regional Water District, and this is Gardening for Pollinators, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our speaker. Our speaker is Teresa Thomas, and she's from the Tarrant County Master Gardeners. My name is Teresa Thomas. I am a Master Gardener, class of 2009. This Tarrant County Master Gardener presentation is on gardening for pollinators. This presentation is supported by our regional water supplier, Tarrant Regional Water District. TRWD maintains four area lakes and pipelines needed to provide surface water to the local water treatment plants so they can clean it to meet the drinking water standards for our communities. They also work with many cities in the Tarrant County area, such as Fort Worth, Arlington, and Mansfield, to provide water conservation programs to the community. Why a pollinator garden? I asked myself the same question, and I said, why not? pollinator garden. It puts you close to nature. You know, when you go out and look at other gardens, it's great to see all the pollinators, the butterflies, the bees, the moths, the hummingbirds, other beneficial insects, your native and non-native plants, and realized I could bring that to my yard. You are also helping the population increase for our, for our butterflies and our moths and our bees and our hummingbirds. So we're going to talk a little bit about what you need to start a pollinator garden. The first thing I'm just going to mention, because it's very important, no chemicals, no pesticides, no herbicides. How much space and what do you want to attract? You may just want to do a monarch way station. Or you may just want to do one that attracts a little bit of everything. Every pollinator. You have to provide food, water, shelter, and safety. And again, a reminder, no chemicals. You can do a balcony. You can do a acre of land or less, or you can do an acre or more. It depends on what you want to do. It is recommended that you start small, and then you can always expand. This is pictures of just a patio where they've added some plants in a corner. This is a door steps where they've put plants here. You can do you know, just a normal backyard. If you've got a small or, or, or large, these are some good examples. If you have enough room, you can have flowering trees such as 
red buds, make some plums. You need to have a bush or two. And you can have salvia gray, gray, gray guy. You can have quince. You can also have perennials, non-perennials. Herbs and grasses. Your grasses are for protection. Here is a garden where this lady has a bunch of room in the back. She has three different types of gardens. And there is her hummingbird feeders. Your garden, you need to go check and see if you've got all sun, morning or afternoon sun, or full sun, shade. Our plants really need the sun to survive to bloom. Here is a garden picture. This is a picture of a sunny garden. I don't see any trees around, so it looks like it gets full sun all day long. And you can see how beautiful these blooms are. The red is the autumn sage. You have grasses in the back. And here on the right is the list of plants you can use for full sun. There are more, but these are great examples. The black-eyed Susan, the coneflowers, uh, the marigolds. This slide shows two different gardens that get part sun and shade. The one on the left looks like they're all native plants and they're doing great. Lots of blooms. The one on the right is a mixture of non-native and native. Lots of blooms. Looks gorgeous. Remember, when you start thinking about planting, you want to plant for all seasons. The spring, the summer, the fall. You want something blooming to draw in our pollinators. About what you're going to do, go outside and you might want to even do a diagram. You need to decide on how wide you want it. 150 square feet is a good size garden to start with. If you want to do a soil sample, this is perfect time to do a soil sample. You can call the Tarrant County Master Gardeners and they will send you out one. So you want to clear all the plant life that's on there. Now don't use weed killer. You still have that spray in there. It might damage your plants. It might cause your pollinators not to grow because that spray stays in that soil. Remove all that plant material. You're going to turn the soil about 10 to 12 inches. And then you want to replenish the soil with organic matter. Two to three A rule of thumb is compo one third compost, one third expanded shale, and one third soil. You can add a fertilizer, a slow release fertilizer if you need to, two or three pounds per hundred square feet. Once you have all that in there, you're going to turn it with a, a fork or a shovel or something in that nature, they say not to till it because it breaks up the surface of the soil, the structure of the soil. You water it deeply, one or two hours. You want it not laying in water, but you want it really nice and wet. You're going to let it dry, whether it's an hour, two hours, or a whole day. You want it damp. And then you're going to plant. So you probably had your plants picked out. You need to look at your water source. Look for your faucet. If you have a sprinkler system, look where the, the sprinklers are. It is a good time to put in drip irrigation if you want to try that. Um, drip irrigation is good because it waters the, so the plants, not the leaves. And as your plants get bigger, Sometimes that sprinkler system doesn't get down to the roots of your plants. So you're ready to go. 
here is just a few butterflies. Uh, we have over 100 different types of butterflies in our North Texas area. They say there's over 25,000 different butterflies throughout the world. They all, all will need their own source of nectar, their host plant, and they will need what they need for safety, their bushes. So the first thing we talked about, and I mentioned earlier, is food. We're talking about food for butterflies, your nectar plants. They like hot colors. They like pink, reds, orange, purple. They like the trumpet shape. They like the tubular shape. Of course, they need the flat. Every now and then, they just need to sit and bask a little bit and warm up. Here are some food sources. If you'll notice the way they're planted, they're planted in drifts. They like the plants to be, the same plant to be all together. You know, it's better not to plant one Turk's cap here and one Turk's cap in another area, and one over here. You know, it's better to keep it all together. A rule of thumb is three to five plants at a time in one area. It will cause a drift like this. They like to get in on the picture on the left, they like to get in there and pollinate and kind of hide out and then they'll just keep going from one place to another. Also the lower area is also planted the same way. Up here on the right is a cross vine. This is perfect for all of our pollinators. Our hummingbirds love it, our bees love it, our butterflies love it. This is our coneflower, which is beautiful. It blooms in the spring, early summer. It's been beautiful this year. This is a thistle that's good for um, all pollinators. This is a sunflower as well. It's good for all pollinators. Food sources, here's for the lava. You've got fennel. This is for the swallowtails. Um, You've got milkweed, which is for the monarchs. You've got these hollies in here that are good. If you'll notice, the flowers open up and you can get, they can get down in there. And then we've got our Texas blue bonnet, our state flower. Our butterflies need other food sources. They like sugary, salty sources. They will go to the hummingbird feeder. You see one right here on the hummingbird feeder. They like rotten fruit in a tray, but you gotta figure out how to keep the ants out. Um, this shows a butterfly on some oranges and there's some ban bananas in here. Here's another picture of more, these are moths on here. If you wanted to lay a tray of food out, you can take and lay it in a tray, then put it in a trough of a little soapy water and the ants won't cross over into the food. If you want to have a little uh, disc with a sponge in it that's got sea salt water in it, they prefer sea salt because it has more nutrients in it than regular table salt. You can put that out somewhere on a step, on a deck. And as I repeat, um, there's a lot of plants out there. You want to bloom from early spring to late fall. They like them in clumps instead of a single plant. Native plants are the best for pollinators. Um, they are evolved and they're in sync with the pollen with the native plants in their area and you need to plant a, maybe a night bloomer because we our moths do pollinate at night as well as the daytime and so do bats yes our butterflies need water their water source and their favorite 
because they get the nutrients they need is muddy areas, with muddy puddles. They're able to drink in the dissolved minerals and nutrients they need. They don't get all their nutrients from nectar. They like to have rocks and bird baths so they can sit there and sun. If a sh saucer, very shallow, is good. This is a butterfly guzzler. This is out at the demonstration garden in Fort Worth for the master gardeners. And this is a bird bath top. It's been filled with gravel and sand. It has a couple of rocks sitting here. They get the water from a rain barrel that is hooked to. These are drips, but you can add water, just a little water. And they love this. When we were out here and I didn't get it fast enough, there was a bee sitting on here. And just a reminder, they love the mud. If you've got a drippy hose, they'll go to where that water is. A drip system line that they'll go to where that where that mister has been. This is an area where you can see that this little girl is watering a little water a bit, bird bath. It's got sand in it. They like wet sand as well. And here's your rocks again so they can light on. This is still just some pictures. This is an area and they've added rocks and they have a water there. This is in the mud and they love this. They're resting here and drinking in the nutrients in a shallow pond. Then we talk about the shelter. This is so important. Our butterflies need shelter. They need a place to rest and they need it for protection. Our monarchs migrate, and so does some of the other sulfurs, but the rest stay here. So they need a place to spend the winter, and they need that protection. In the summer, a butterfly may spend 14 hours a day quietly resting, waiting for it to warm up enough so they can fly. They can't get circulation going in their wings until the temperature is from 80 to 86 degrees. So on the pleasant nights of 75 degrees, they have to hide and rest. So they're just like any other creature. They need a safe place to hang out. Our baby butterflies or caterpillars, we have to provide a protection for them as well so they can lay their eggs. This is the most important and the dangerous time for a butterfly. They have to hide a little bit because their bird food or other critters can get to them at this point. They're not, they can't protect themselves. Here they hang upside down. Here's a caterpillar. This is a monarch. There's a chrysalis. So they need some where they can hang and hide their eggs and, and grow into another generation. Lava food, the monarchs, of course, do milkweed. And you will learn more of the lava foods for the different butterflies as you read and study. But you see, they just go to town, eat away. This is another type of butterfly. Here is its caterpillar. You see how it's eating this leaf. They'll eat them. You'll wonder what happened to the leaves on your on your plants. Where in the world? And here's your monarch. Not monarch. Here's your other butterfly. If you're interested in a butterfly sta and a monarch station, you can go to monarchwatch.org. They will give you all the information. You can to set up a garden. If you want to be certified, they'll tell you that too. Just a reminder, our butterflies love the sun. They love the flat rocks 
where they can use their wings as a heat collector for their bodies. They want shallow water because of the salt and the minerals. And you have to have certain plans for feeding, for hosting your pollinator. Monarchs, the milkweeds, a variety of the swallowtail, parsley, dill, fennel, carrot tops, bee balm. Let's not forget about our pretty moths. Along with the daytime butterflies, you will draw various moths. They can be active both day and night. The big difference between a butterfly and a moth is their antenna. The butterfly always has a long, slender stalk, and the moth has a brush or combed antenna. When they rest, their wings are flat. Butterflies, wings just slightly are vertical, stand vertical. But moths also benefit plants by pollinating flowers or feeding on their nectar. And so that helps with the seed production. This is not the only benefits for wild plants, but also many of our food crops which depend on moths as well as other insects to ensure a good harvest. While most pollinators just visit different gardens, moths live most of their time in the same garden. Moths are attracted to gardens with a mix of plants such as grasses and flowers and shrubs and trees. A moth-friendly garden should be pest-free, pesticide-free. Let me say that again, pesticide-free. It should also contain mulch, not rock. Plant clippings and falling leaves should be allowed to accumulate a little. That gives them a safe hiding spot for them. Four clocks, roses, dogwood, oakwood, salvias, blue stem grasses, flowering tobacco, petunias are great plants for our moths. Let's talk about our birds, our hummingbirds. They need the same thing. They need food, water, shelter, a place to rest, and a good place to raise their young. Our hummingbirds, the hummingbird. The hummingbird eats insects and pollinates. That helps reduce the need for pesticides. But I'm going to say again, no pesticides. Some examples of natural source foods are Greg salvia, coral, honeysuckle, turk's cap, red Columbine, crossvine, flame acanthus, red yuccas. They love all these and you can just see them flitter from place to place. Behind the beauty of this fast flying bird lies an issue that a lot of people don't know about. Hummingbirds are struggling with their migration patterns in the winter due to starvation. Many hummingbirds travel south for the winter and often travel through Texas, and they've got where they stay during this season. The flowers providing nectar are not only the nutrition source of hummingbirds, insects are nutrition or a source as well. This places emphasis on planting Texas native plants that have a long extending blooming life and always keeping the hummingbird feeders clean and full. When you're planting your hummingbird heaven, be sure to plant colorful plants. Allow the hummingbirds to see them in clusters since they like plants that don't have a lot of uh, fragrance. They need the visual
with a hummingbird a natural pattern is returning to the same food sources. It's called trap lining. But they do get curious and look for new places. The natural or the native or our flowers, this draws them into our hummingbird feeders. <coughs> they like the color of the red hummingbird feeder. If you have a hummingbird feeder that doesn't have the color on it, you can buy, you know, put some kind of colored tape on it. That is the one you keep clean. Sometimes you clean it every day. It depends on the time of weather. So, and it keeps it from being contaminated so they don't get any kind of disease. Here are some plants for the hummingbird. This is a great little old uh, chart here. It's a Texas smart chart. It gives you some ideas, the desert willow. And if you'll notice how they're made, the bearded iris, the phlox, the obedient plant, the turk's cap, the flamencanthus. We use a lot of turk's cap in our yard and they, they just go to it. Between it and our feeder, they have the best time. You know, it's hard to get good pictures of hummingbirds. So if you have a video, that is great. Use that. But I've seen some great pictures that people have taken over the years. Do they need water? Yes, of course. But they like fresh water, circulating water. They like the droplets from a rain or from the morning dew that's left on leaves. They can just fly down and pick up that water in a, in a bird bath. Do they bathe? Yes. They get dirty, so they've got to take a little bath every now and then. Do hummingbirds need shelter? Yes, of course. They like the woody type of shelter. They even like it if it has a little thorns in it. Just added protection. They like to perch. As I read, they perch about 80% of the time in between feedings. So they need shelter from predators and from the sun and the rain. And this is also a good place for their nest. The interesting thing about their nest, and you know they're tiny, they say the nest is no bigger than a bottle cap or a ping pong ball. So it's amazing that they do survive. So when you build your safe heaven, check out the native or plants or adapted plants in your area, in our area. You usually can get a list and they're part of that hundred and top 110 list from uh, Texas Smart. If you need any help, of course, we'll be glad to help you the Tarrant County Master Gardeners or any are the Native Plant Society, the Texas Master Naturalist are all available to help you plant a garden. Our bees. Where you have flowers, you're gonna have bees. If you want to raise honey bees, you need an adequate spot and space. A small yard may not be sufficient for the safety. Uh, they take up a lot of room and they need to be in a private area away from people. Their hives do. Your solitary bee, which is your bee that's, that lives alone, that lives in tunnels, like your mason bees, can be an asset to your yard and your neighborhood without taking up a lot of space. Our honeybees were introduced from Europe in the early, by the early settlers. Before they came over, the native bees did all of our pollination and they're still very effective for the native plants. 
honeybees are so important to our honey population and population of so many of our crops. One hive of honeybees can consist of many thousands of bees. They say two bites out of three bites of food we eat delivers billions of dollars of free ecosystem services to humanity every year. They prefer the nectar over the pollen. They will pick up the pollen as they move. They visit a lot of blossoms. They just go everywhere, yard to yard. But they're very precise in how they approach a blossom, very meticulous. So sometimes they don't get all that pollen. It is said that only 5% of the blossoms visited by a single bee will result in a successful transfer of pollen. So this is why you need an entire hive of bees to make of bees for two acres of trees. Also, they can have con cross contamination as well. The honey bees will always be our major role in the commercial population. Solitary bees or mason bees or honey bees. Now, honey bumblebees, I'm sorry, bumblebees do produce honey. But not very much, but it's still used commercially. But your mason bees are perfect for your backyard. They're growing in population because of our honeybees are kindly in decline and we hope to change all that. They're gentle. They can be raised by anyone. You don't have to worry about being stung. Usually if you don't be aggressive with them, they'll leave you alone. Your mason bees like to stay in one area. On the job, all your honeybees and your mason bees, your bumblebees, they all get along and work together side by side without conflict to give the pollination that they need for your crops and your flowers. The mason bee is being used more as in the orchards now because of the decline in the honeybees. And I, sometimes there are, there is one that's called blue orchard bees. They have a different character altogether. They're not really concerned about the loss of pollen. They just go from plant to plant. Just don't care. They're erratic. They fly back and forth in between the trees. Instead of having pollinator baskets, masons are equipped with a hairy abdominal with specialized hairs. They crawl around on the blossom with their pollinator packed abdominals touching every part of that blossom. They drop a lot along the way more than your honeybees. Our bees are amazing pollinators. We need to protect them by avoiding pesticides and chemicals, which will, which are deadly to them and their reproduction. They like milkweed, butterfly weed, shasta, daisies, goldenrod, lavender. Do bees need water and shelter? Yes, they do. They need it just like any animal, any insect. But the honeybees kind of have a purpose for their water. They, in the winter, they take that water and they dissolve the crystal honey and thin it out a little bit if it gets too thick. 
In the summer, they sprayed the droplets of water along the edges of the cone and then fan the cone with their wings. Solitary bees, mason bees, honey bees need water or there's no life. But they can't just use any water. They need fresh, clean water. You do not want them to have contaminated water because it spreads diseases. They need homes. And you see the honey bee hives, they need to be on a large area away from um, people. They probably need to be fenced in. In the winter or in the bad weather, some people just cover them really well to protect them from wind and rain and all that. Uh, these are their hives. This is a mason bee house. I've seen people make these and they go in here and this is where they hibernate in the winter. If you have one, you can buy one and put it up under a tree in a sun, sunny area in the winter. In the summer, you can watch them as they get ready to settle down for the winter. This is another honeybee house. Now, both the masons and the honeybees will go in here together. Here's some information about some other pollinators in our yard. Now we don't plan to have these, but we do have ants and flies and wasps and mosquitoes, beagles. I'm not sure about the maggots, but I was really, it has a really interesting story. Ants are relative, it's relative rare, but they can distribute pollen grains over a wide area. Thus, promote the genetic diversity among plants that they visit. Since they walk from plant to plant, it's very, very small. In Australia, they pollinate several orchids and lilies effectively. And here's our flies. Many flies do prefer to eat on flowers and in doing so provide the necessary pollination to serve the plants they visit. They are important and efficient pollinators where bees have less activity, such in the alpine and the arctic habitats. The hoover flies have a modified mouth part so they can sip the nectar. <clears throat> they pollinate fruits like apples, oranges, and cherries. Here's your wasp. There's only one species that feed on nectar and pollinate their young. They pollinate an orchid as well, but they're best known for their pollination as a fig wasp. They pollinate the tiny flowers to develop the fig fruits. Without them, there'd be no figs in the wild. Your mosquitoes. Our mosquitoes are known for feeding on blood, but their favorite food is nectar. The male drinks the nectar before he mates and energizes him. They do pollinate certain orchids, and there are other plants as well. I just don't have them now. The beetle is interesting to me because it was prehistoric pollinator. They say they were around a good 50 million years before bees. They like to pollinate marigolds and water lilies. These plants, well, the plants they depend on have to be fragrant or often fragrant. They give off a spicy, fragrant scent or decayed scents that attracts the beetles. Beetles are called mess and soil pollinators because they chew it and then they release those droppings. The one thing I learned about the maggots, there is a flying one. 
and it pollinates the tiny yellow flower on the coca tree, enabling that tree to produce fruit so we can have chocolate. What would we do without chocolate? Here are some resources. Uh, most of my information comes from the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Office. This is their email address, agrilifeextension.tamu at edu. You can get a plant list from the Native Plant Society that will give you a list of native plants for pollination and just a general nice list on their website. The Tarrant County Master Gardener Association you can contact us. Um, our helpline is listed here. We're open from 8.30 to 4.30. There is our email address. You can send an email as well. We will get back with you. And you also have our website. And now might be a good time to start a garden or maybe to add to the garden you already have. In October, there are three plant sales. The first week of October is the Fort Worth Garden sorry, the Fort Worth Botanic Garden plant sale. On October the 8th is a Master Gardener plant sale. On uh, October the 24th, I believe, is the Native Plant plant sale. You can go online and get the list from any of these. If you have questions, contact us. We'll answer the best we can. We'll give you the best information available. If you plant, they will come. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Teresa, and thank you everyone for joining us. If you have any questions, you're welcome to enter them into the text box right now, and we will get back to you with an answer, or you can go to any of those resources that Teresa gave you during her presentation. Um, you can also email your questions to conservation at trwd.com. So any of those ways you want, if you have a question, we'll be happy to answer it. We'll send it over to Teresa so that she can answer it. Um, and once again, you can go to safetyinourwater.com to look at some of the um, other events that are happening just like this in the future. And if you'd like, you can also sign up for our newsletter where um, once a month you'll get some information about water conservation landscaping, native plants, things that are going on um, that month and everything and all of our events. So thank you so much again for joining us for this um, Gardening for Pollinators presentation sponsored by Tarrant Regional Water District, Arlington Public Libraries, and Arlington Water Utilities. Have a great day.